We would like to welcome everybody here at Maranatha Baptist Church. And for those who are watching online, good evening or good morning. And let's go in and stand at this time. And let's go and open our hymn books to number 306 to number 306. And this is a great, beautiful hymn, which this church uh, we all believe in is Jesus Saves. So let's go ahead and sing it loud to the Lord. talking about right let me think jesus saves how about that i like that preacher jaime reyes would you look the lord in prayer sir let's pray he's Your tired heavenly, let's pray for him you. okay Dear heavenly father we give you so much thanks lord for allowing us to be here in the middle of the week in wednesday thank you lord for using me in a in that jail lord in a federal prison in county jail thank you for those souls lord and now, Lord, I pray for these 
one dollar offering on a Wednesday night. Take control of service. We love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. Enjoy the afternoon. would agree that Brother Jacob's doing a fantastic job on this piano. Doing a great job. Praise the Lord. Let's go and open our hymn books to number 307. To number 307, Send the Light. This is Psalms 150, and I hope it's approved because it's a King James Bible. <laughs> so here we go. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with string instruments. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath 
Praise the Lord. Praise He the Lord. Praise the Lord. I say that all the time, but I mean it. I really, really do. And thank you, Brother Jay. You know, not only was he praising the Lord in that wonderful hymn, Psalm 150, but he also uh, dealt with some uh, issues that some might have about, you know, what what instruments you can use in the church. It sounds to me like stringed instruments, which I say a guitar classifies as one. Uh for sure, can be used. Tambourines are mentioned in the scriptures, lots of different instruments. I think it has a whole lot more to do with how you use it, don't you? Is it really being used as an instrument of praise or is it being used as an instrument to draw attention to yourself? And that, I think, makes a big difference. Uh, Can you think of another stringed instrument besides the ones on this side of the platform? Is there another one on the platform? The piano, that's right. And there wasn't pianos back when they wrote the scripture, but the piano was uh, readily ushered in. But you know, the piano actually, and this is, this was controversy at the time. Uh, the piano was considered a, an instrument that was used in, well, let's just say casual settings where people drank and did things like that. And there was a lot of controversy over whether or not a piano ought to be let into the sacred house of the Lord. Hmm, how about that? And you know, what's interesting also is some of the hymns, some of the actual, you know, these hymns that we love so dearly and we're so thankful for, uh, we're thankful for them because of the heart of the individuals who wrote them. They began as people live in their lives as Christians, and they began as poetry. But when they, when they began to be then, um, you know, companioned with music, a lot of the music at that time, believe it or not, that was music that was coming out of the world. And so it just helps us to make sure we know a little bit more about sometimes what we think we know. I can tell you this for sure. Uh, We want to be Christ-honoring. We want to magnify and glorify the Lord in our music. And we want it to be biblically sound. There's some wonderful hymns that I I actually like. I I love to just, some that I sang maybe even for years. And then I began to start to think, you know, that's not exactly biblical. (laughs) Step into the water, wait out a little bit deeper. Now, it's okay if you're just talking about the importance of baptism. But if you're talking about being saved by baptism, then you are off, aren't you? How about that? That was all free before we get we start preaching. So let's do that. Let's get into our Bibles this evening first. Thessalonians, Thursday, bleh, I should have left it after I did it the first time. First, Thessalonians, or the church at Thessalonica. Chapter 2, chapter 2. And let's, you know, I kind of went back and forth on this. Here's what I think I'm going to do. Let's look, and I like the salutation. I know you and I have had time to... Uh, focus on the salutation, and we've talked about Paul's salutation in most of his letters, but let's just include it. So let's begin at the first verse and look at the first five verses, and that'll help us with the first point of our outline tonight. So notice 1 Thessalonians, actually beyond the salutation, chapter 2. We're going to begin right there. Chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. For yourselves, brethren, know our inheritance or our entrance into you that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi. 
We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God, which with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. By the way, the very fact that they mention this also causes us to consider that there must have been others who, well, were speaking and they were using deceit and uncleanness and they were doing what they were doing in guile. Look at verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. And you talk about a, a, a message for every Christian. There you go. I can tell you for sure. I've mentioned this before, and for everyone who ever shares the gospel, or anyone who ever leads a Bible study, anyone who ever heads up a Sunday school class or uh, teaches in children's ministries, uh, in adult ministries, ladies' ministries, or preaches from this pulpit, they must take very, very, very seriously the preaching and teaching of the gospel. Notice what it says again. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust. Have you thought about that? Every time you uh, have the opportunity, uh, we have some of our uh, uh, teaching teams right in here right now. Uh, you're put in trust. That's important, isn't it? Yeah. And it says that you're put in trust with the gospel, even as we speak. And, you know, I don't think he's trying to be curse here when he says, not as pleasing men, but God. You know, sometimes I think that phraseology lends us to believe that he says, I, I don't care what you think. I know what the Lord thinks. You know, most people, when they say it that way, usually there might be something a little wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we're going to talk today about love. We're going to talk today about one who came against a lot of opposition, yet taught us how to exercise love. And now look at verse 5. For neither at any time used we, catch this, Flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Amen. Father, we do thank you for your word. And Lord, even just taking a moment with the first five verses of chapter two, uh, we can see for sure how absolutely critically important it is to have a right heart and a right spirit. We talked a moment ago about music. Music is ministry, and so is everything else that we do, including getting in our car and coming to this building and fellowshipping together and assembling together. The preaching and the teaching, the praying, the music, it's all to honor and glorify you, and it's all, it's important that all of it is done in the right spirit with the right heart. And you know, Lord, sometimes we might even say that it is, but I think we need to examine our own hearts sometimes and ask ourselves, are there times when we kind of have motives and and maybe we're not always being open and honest with ourselves. Help us to see all that today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. First Thessalonians chapter 2, scroll down to verse 8. 
verse 8. I mean, just in consideration of what you just heard, the scripture you heard, notice verse 8. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because we, because ye, were dear unto us. Amen? You know, I just believe with all my heart that this missionary, this apostle, this preacher, this teacher, this pastor, this church planter was all about people. And you know what? He may have even had a propensity for that as Saul of Tarsus. He may, in his zealous previous Jewish leadership, pharisaical life, uh, thought, you know what? I'm doing this for God and I'm going to, you know, uh, and I care. Well, whether that's the case or not, I can tell you for sure, he was zealous and he was he became even more committed and more sure, absolutely sure, when he came to trust Christ as Savior. But I'll tell you something that he saw, that he got. People matter. Ministry is people. Our walk in relationship with the Lord includes people. It's all about people. Now, I'll tell you, it's interesting because I I think I mentioned this a a few messages ago. (laughs) Sometimes they kind of blend together a little bit. But, you know, I know some people who are hard preachers and, but it's, it, it, and, 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 let me wait, time out. They're not hard preachers. They're wrong. They're guys that get behind a pulpit and spend 45 minutes of the Lord's time trying to beat up the other guy down the street rather than focus on preaching the Word of God. Now, we preach against sin. Amen? Should have got an amen there. (laughs) Yeah, amen. We preach against sin. God hates sin. No doubt. But, you know, I remember uh, over the years, especially my ministry began in the independent Baptist movement and has continued there. There was a time when, boy, there was just a big fight over who's the most independent and who's the most Baptist. And, you know, there's always... It's, it's, it's right and appropriate to have conversation and contend for the faith. Amen? But I, I can tell you that there is also a recognition that if people, first and foremost, don't think you care, they don't care what you have to say. And you know the saying, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Now, we get that when it comes to soul winning. Amen? We understand. Matter of fact, that's the focus. How to win friends and influence people. But then there's a dash and it says, for Christ. Amen? But you see, it goes beyond that. You know, I I tend to think of, for some, how it might have been a little awkward that it seems like maybe the nicest person in the whole wide world knocked on their door one day and told them about Jesus. And uh, once they said yes, then okay, we're done. (laughs) Now we're going to talk about why you're late for church. How come you don't do this? And how come you forget about that? And You know, this same love that we're to have for the lost is magnified when we now have the opportunity to have love for the brethren. 
Isn't it how, it, I mean, it's really, it's really sad that we'll be, we'll be, friendly, we'll be friendlier to a stranger than we will be to somebody who's maybe new in the Lord or is coming and searching and seeking. And how about this? How about people who we have had the privilege? Do you realize that some of us have been hanging around together? Think about this, Tommy Garcia, for you and I have known each other for 19 years. Wow. You're old, brother. I'm just telling you. <laughs> you know? And so that's why that verse, verse 8, is so precious. Look with me again at this verse. So being affectionately desirous. How about that? This is our relationship with each other. Affectionately desirous of each other. We are willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel only. I mean, that, that would sure be enough but our own souls. And why? Because ye were dear unto us. I'm giving you, brother, sister, I want to I wanna be able to say what Paul says. They were willing to give our own souls. That means we're giving, our, giving ourselves because we're to be that dear to each other. That's called authentic. That's where he's at with this. And that's what we see in verses 3 through 5. You see, in Paul's day, roaming philosophers, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of crazy stuff that was going on. Sounds a whole lot like today. Sorcerers and other peddlers use tricks to impress their audiences. Sounds kind of like the Old West. Remember the, the parlor tricks and all the other things that went on? The, the, the guy uh, selling elixir off the back of his wagon, you know? I told Anita that was the first Dr. Pepper right there. Amen? <laughs> I'm probably right. <laughs> Dr. Pepper came from Waco, Texas. What else can we say? Paul approached them with honesty and an absence of deception on purpose chose not to be deceptive, not to use deceit, not to use manipulation. He chose on purpose to be honest, direct, and decisive. You see, the same, we, we believe this is right for soul winning, we believe this is right for witnessing. And we believe this is right for serving. This is right when it comes to growing together. You see, Paul loved these people. He, he made enemies family. You know... Again, we all we got to do is watch a little. No, we don't have to watch anything. Our phone tells us even if we're not watching television. I don't even think we have it. What's a television anyway? You know, is it this size screen or this size screen or, you know, whatever. I can tell you this. We live in a world of manipulation and deceit. We're told that that's the only way you can run a business. They, we're told that that politics can't operate any other way. But the real truth is, when we look at our founding fathers, they knew the heart. And the checks and balances that are supposed to be in place are in place because, biblically speaking, they knew the heart. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Amen? So Paul said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be authentic. We're going to love one another. We're going to choose to on purpose. And how about this? This is a word that needs to be added to the vocabulary. 
gentle. Look at verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth, I like the CHs there, her children. The image is of, is a mother breastfeeding her child, a picture of tenderness and selflessness. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The love chapter, verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity is love in action. Part of the fruit of the Spirit. That that, that choir guy I have keeps talking about. What, 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 what verse is that? That's right. Very good, Mom. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. And in 5.23, we read that part of, because, you, you know, it isn't fruits of the Spirit. And, and that's critical. All of the fruit of the Spirit is to be recognized. And one, and one part of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness which involves patience, empathy mercy we can also see how clearly if we're not doing this at home we're guaranteeing that we're going to be running off our kids by the time they go through one more Sunday school with us where we're a different person than we were five minutes ago. You see, when we talk about loving the brethren and being honest and being authentic and being gentle, the most important ministry begins at home. There's, there's too many examples in Scripture of good men who had crazy kids and in some cases, they may have even done the very best that they could, and, and it, things just went that way. But in a lot of cases, as you study Scripture, you see where that wasn't the case. If we don't get it right at home, we're going to lose our first ministry. And now, notice verse 11. Let's read. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. You see, Paul shifts his image to that of a father who exhorted, encouraged, and charged his children to be all that they could be. Love is not gullible nor does it ignore situations and evil that threaten. We're talking about a, a life worthy of God. This, this authentic life that we live, we're living before our friends and our family. We're living before our children and our grandchildren. And we're finding out, grandparents, by the way, this is the grandparent team, amen, God bless you. With the babies in the back, like Brother Jay, you just you'll get there soon enough, but don't get there too soon, amen. Man, I'll tell you what, your authentic life is still touching their life.
The Father Paul has in mind cares for one of his children and is personally involved to help each toward maturity. Love is never effective at long distance. I mean, how sad it is that some God has used in mighty ways and praise the Lord for that regret that some of the most, the most important ministry in their life missed some of the same needed tenderness and, and honesty that this person in ministry might exercise today. I can't help but think of uh, some of the more contemporary ones. And when I say that, we're talking about over the last 300 years. We think of... We think of those who God just used in a mighty way. You know, if it weren't for... If it weren't for preachers, we wouldn't have the Constitution that we have today. If it weren't for the pulpit, we wouldn't have not only the Constitution, but a, a culture, whether they want to admit it or not, that is still, it is still influenced by men and women of God that came before us. But then when we hear about the regret that one might have because they were careful to do what they knew they needed to do, but they didn't recognize that that also meant at home, it's a sad, sad truth. Look with me at verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when he, when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. And Notice, it, it, then it says, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins. To, that's exactly how it's written. To fill up their sins always, for the wrath is to come upon them uh, to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. I mean, consider for a moment our missionaries on the mission field, some of the challenges and difficulties that, that they find. And I would hope we could also relate to some of the difficulties. I don't know if anybody has, you know, taken you and beaten you up lately. 
But you know, what I, what in the midst of all that they were going through and all that was taking place, they were longing for reunion with their brethren, with the people that they love. Look at verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? This is the relationship that we're talking about. These verses refer to ways in which Paul sought to keep his love up to date. He was texting them. He was, he was communicating with them. If some of you prefer email, okay, you old-fashioned people, you. His love was deepened through daily prayer for the Thessalonians. He corresponded with them and endeavored to see them face to face. I mean, that's exactly what he says in verse 17. Endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Paul was not too timid to say, I love you. You know, I, I just got to tell you something. Before I came to know the Lord, I my idea of love was what the world says that love is. One of the most overwhelming things that happened to me was when Anita and I, with our two small children, were received into a church family and loved. I'll never forget, we were living in La Quinta, and we began to start visiting Desert Baptist Church. Desert Baptist Church met in the community center in the park. We would have church inside the community center, small area there, and we'd have Sunday school out under a gazebo. We... were new to the church. But I can tell you, I can remember we we literally moved closer to where the church was, which is kind of a neat thing. I'd like to see more people think that that's an important thing to do. And and it was it was my birthday, so folks um you know, said, you know what? Happy birthday. Maybe we'll stop by. Well, they had done more than that. They had all planned to come by and help us to move and started taking our, started taking our stuff. No, just started moving us. And, and I, man, I, I, I had to go around the corner and cry like a baby because that wasn't the world that I was used to. These people had no agenda. They were, they, they were not fake. They were not trying to sell me something. They didn't see something that they could get out of me. They saw exactly what it is that Paul sees. They, they, they saw a, a, a reality in what it means to be brethren, to be brothers and sisters. This is, again, as, I, as I've said, I remember... This is why I thought, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I thought that was, I thought that was like a, um, you know, a independent Baptist, you know, song that every every church sang. But you know what? Can I tell you something? 
sometimes we begin to lose sight of this. No one was more doctrinally explicit, more absolute in his beliefs than Paul. Yet his love relationship for the lost, going to the lost, a debtor to the Jew and the Gentile, did not stop there. We believe in sharing the gospel. It, what he would do is he would go out and he would make spiritual children. And he would stay in touch with them. He would keep up to speed on them. He would go and see them and visit them. He would, he would do whatever it took to keep an up-to-date love relationship with his spiritual children and his grandchildren. I mean, can you imagine just for a moment what it's like when somebody comes to your heart that you're thinking of and you haven't seen them here for a while and maybe you just drop a, a, a quick text how encouraging that can be. It's just absolutely amazing. And I love watching you do this. And and what's marvelous about this is so many of you do this all the time through social media, uh, you know, just texting somebody and literally calling somebody, uh, maybe even swinging by. And, and you make all the difference in the world because they know it's real. They know who you are. They know that you care. And so as we get ready to pray right now, let me ask you this question. How is your love life? It's important, but it's a much more important question to a brother and sister, to the brethren, to a Christian. We have to examine our hearts. We have to ask ourselves, is our life characterized by a love for people? <laughs> is it authentic? Is it gentle? Is it firm? Is it current? Is it real or fake? What are our motives? Why do we do what we do? Paul helps us to see in, in clear interaction here in ministry in real time for him, exactly what we ought to do. Lord, we do thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to get together. Thank you for the opportunity that we have now to spend some time in prayer. And we just pray right now, even during this time, that you would, in fact, prick our hearts, have your way with us. Might we intercede for each other? Uh, this is this is what Paul did more than anything else. He prayed for the brethren, and and he says, "I do not cease to pray for you." Speak to hearts, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. All right.